oftentimes when we have a big, important conversation, there's this asymmetrical information thing that happens where the person who wants to have that conversation has already thought everything out. And the person who is not ready for that conversation doesn't know what's going to happen is can be overwhelmed by that, particularly if they're the one with ADHD and they're maybe the cause of some of the reasons why we're having this conversation. Right. So what my wife started doing for me, that was great. I didn't ask her to, she started doing it was she would send me an email when she wanted to talk about something that she knew got me all tweaky and would just kind of like, give me a general idea about what she wanted to discuss. And she would send it to me while I was at work. And I would then have like the rest of the day before I got home to think about what I wanted to add to that conversation, what my ideas were. And then I came to that conversation more prepared and they went a lot smoother. So I highly recommend using that kind of a strategy. If you've got a big idea that you need to talk to with a partner, send them a little bit of a hint with some bullet points or something so that they can process in advance. And then you come to the table and you both have thoughts. ADHD Rewired episode 375. This is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection and you are not alone. Go to ADHDrewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we mention on today's show. You can support us on Patreon, sign up for our email newsletter, you can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups, and you can learn all about our intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. You can do all of this at our website, ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. We are here for our live monthly Q&A. We are in April. So if you're hearing this on the podcast, happy May. What you're hearing was recorded in April. So we have our whole podcast family here, uh, starting with myself. We also have Moira Mabin. Hello. Moira is the host of the ADHD Friendly Lifestyle, which you can now find on your favorite podcast app. Next, we have Will Curb. Hey there. Will is the host of Hacking Your ADHD. Go check his podcast out. Also available on all podcast platforms. We also have MJ Siemens. Hello, everybody. Check out MJ's podcast, ADHD Diversified. And uh, the, the first member of the, uh, the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network, Brendan the Hand. What's up, team? How's it going? And of course, Brendan is the host of ADHD Essentials. And we want to also introduce Barb, who uh, is kind of, she doesn't have a podcast yet, um, but she is, uh, she's, she's my executive functions here at ADHD Rewired. And so uh, we, um, I've uh, asked Barb to, to kind of be our executive functions here as a podcast network for this live Q&A as she helps kind of filter the questions and bring people up so we can be as focused as our brains will allow. Uh, so Barb, hello. Hi there. How does it feel to be on a podcast? It feels great. <laughs> All right. We have uh, we have Rob who is going to be asking uh, his our first question here. So, Rob, let me get you unmuted here. And uh, what is your question? Hey, everyone. Um, every time I go to the psychiatrist, he asks me how I'm going with my medications. I find it hard to know how I should answer because I'm not really sure what to expect with my medita- medication or what he's expecting me to say. How can I talk about my progress objectively? Great, great question. Um, so it, 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 I almost joke when I talk about this because it's like when a, when a doctor asks uh, someone with ADHD, you know, how have things been going? Like what they're asking for is like since the last time they saw you, what we as people with ADHD typically would answer is like how things have been going in the last 24 hours. And so... 
I think one of the ways that that to really give that kind of feedback to the doctor is through doing some data tracking on how you're doing and keeping it simple, though. It's I think it's really easy to overcomplicate uh, sort of data tracking. Um, I know I think that uh, uh, CADRA, the uh, Canadian um, ADHD organization, has some really great um, uh, medication tracking forms. Uh, so you don't need to sort of reinvent the wheel. But one of the things that I have done, and I'd like to hear from everyone else, too, who's on uh, medication, is I have taken just like one or two of the things that I was wanting to target um, for me when I was when I was doing some medication tweaking. I was looking at how easy or difficult I found it to get started. And that was, I just focused on that one piece. Um, and that was something that was helpful. Um, what, what about everyone else? Moira, go ahead. This is a something that I was, I'm really interested in. And yeah, so CADRA, um, and if I can put the link to the PDF in the, um, uh, in the chat, I will. It has one that basically has a scale that you just sort of, unchanged for your symptoms, your tolerability of medication and your quality of life. And it's like a one to three for each one, either direction. Then it has you do the side effects because if you don't know the side effects either, how do you know if some of this stuff is happening? And it's just really like not at all sometimes often. So they're pretty easy that you could do once a month or just prior to going. The other piece though is um, there's something called the WESS and it's W E. ISS, Functional Impairment Rating Scale. And that is developed, it's a self-report on your symptoms. So, and again, it has, you know, kind of that sometimes not at all, often or very much, you can do it once a month. They also have kid versions that the kids can do and then parents can do and teachers can do. Um, and it's a really kind of good check-in to take to your practitioner of how you're doing. And it also can give you tips on um, just that you may be doing better or worse than you thought because it's it's subjective. So that's something that I've, and Attitude has one article called How to Tell if Your ADHD Medication is Working. Dropping some value bombs on that answer. Thanks, Moira. Uh, Will, anything to, you want to add to that one? Yeah, this is something I've always struggled with too, because I do definitely do the like, oh, this is, I'm doing great today. I made it to an appointment. And yeah, it's using that, like, trying to, like, write down how my weeks, months went and being really simple about it. I've one point just used a thing where it was just happy faces and frowny faces. And that can work great. Right. It took so little time to do. It, it made it so, okay, today was happy. Today was not happy. That's great. Brendan, what about you? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share a little tale, if I may. So I am now... Three months without Concerta, maybe two what? months. I don't know. Time is weird. Here's what happened. My insurance changed and I just couldn't get my medication for a little while because my insurance changed. And then the new insurance didn't know who I was when my doctor tried to send the prescription over to them, couldn't find me. And so I wound up being off Concerta for like a month and a half because I just couldn't, um, unless I wanted to drop like disgusting amounts of money to be on concern and I just wasn't there yet. Um, and I felt very similar to, and this is not advice, by the way, this is just a tale. Don't take this as advice, please, please, God, don't take this as advice. Um, but I had a very similar perspective to Rob where I was like, how, I don't really know. Like, how do I know? And the only thing I noticed was like Eric was saying was it was easier for me to start stuff. Right. Then concerned vanished from my life for an extended period of time. Right. And the most important thing I noticed was that I was way more patient with my kid, both of them, but one of them has been a little more needing of my patients than the other. Uh, and so I uh, made the deliberate decision to not continue with it until after COVID is over, because it's more important that I'm patient with my kid than it is that I'm like extra productive relative to how productive I ordinarily am. So I'm getting enough done it's not like I'm crippled, right? Like I'm getting enough done. I have all the strategies and skills and stuff to be able to do the things that I need to do. It's harder. It's more anxiety inducing. I'm burning anxiety for fuel more than usual. Maybe because if I'm more patient with my kid, then probably the COVID, the Concerta was making me like my baseline anxiety was probably higher. So I might just be having higher spikes here and there when I have to do something and 
but broadly speaking, I'm lower down. Um, I don't, I don't say this to be like, so what you should do is just don't take your medication for a month and a half and see how things are different. That's not at all what I'm saying, but it was interesting. It like, I really learned a lot from this experience. So the moral of the story is, um, is if your insurance changes and you're kicked off of your medication, no, um, is pay attention to all areas, right? Don't just think about the stuff that the, the ADHD medication is supposed to be helping and ignore the other aspects of your life that probably also matter and are less obvious, which is what happened to me. I was like, I'm getting stuff done, but I wasn't noticing that it was affecting my level of patience. Cause when I started Concerta, it didn't matter because I wasn't with my kids 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And then I was, and when I, and that became a thing, that's all. Yeah. Um, so I hope that those answers were, were helpful. Um, so do we have another question? We have a question from Sandra. Okay. And what's the question? The question is, how can you tell the difference between a teenager being defiant about doing, doing daily chores or their ADD being the issue? How should I handle the situation? This kid is officially diagnosed by a professional. All right. I was going to say, I, I think Brendan would like to, uh, to, to handle this one. Go for it. Uh, assume it's the ADHD. Baseline assumptions. Everyone is doing the best they can. Give the why. Yeah. Everybody wants to do well and your kids want to please you. Let's start with those assumptions. If those are our assumptions, then the kid is not being defiant because they want to do well. They're trying their best and they want to please us. Right. So why would they be defiant? It must be a skills thing. It must be an ADHD skill thing. So you, you got to crack that. You got to figure out what is the skill set that's missing. What are they not understanding? Probably you got to make it easier to start and then they'll tally ho from there. No, I think, I, I mean, I even think about myself uh, as, as a teenager. Um, this is pre, pre-diagnosis. And um, it, were there times where I just like wanted to, you know, I just was in a fit, feeling like I'm in a defiant mood. And, you know, part of that too is one of like ADHD is an understimulated brain. So what stimulates the brain? arguing with your parents, right? So like, don't, don't medicate through toxic interactions. Right. Um, yeah. So I, I just think the idea of like, always assume that if they're challenging, if they're, you know, well, why do I have to do this? Like just assume they're information seeking. Like even if their tone, it's like, you know, 99 out of hundred people would say, no, they're just, they're being defiant. Like shape it into information seeking and it can be so diffusing to situations. A good reminder for me is often too, is the whole notion of being three to five years developmentally behind. So I have a 15 year old and, and so if that, if she was 12 or 10, what would be a reasonable expectation, especially around things like scaffolding, like building up those, those skill levels and being able to do things that we want them to be able to do. Yeah, I guess, you know, being like from my experience as a teen, if, any communication was very like, well, you have to do this and you have to do that. And why can't you do that? It, it makes, you know, it, it really, for me, it engaged something that was not awesome and it would create an argument. And actually I can kind of relate to that point that you said, Eric, of like, yeah, what's well, a great way to stimulate your brain, argue with your parents. And that's not helpful for either party. Um, Obviously, I didn't know any better as a teen and I was undiagnosed. So I think if, it, if things were framed a little bit differently, maybe we could have not argued at that point. So um, I guess I would agree with Brendan, too, is I yeah, just assume it's the ADHD, because I think if I would have known it was ADHD, probably would may have been met with a little bit more compassion and information. Reminds me of that uh, that phrase that I love that uh, arguing with a with a kid with ADHD is like mind wrestling with a pig. You both get dirty, but only the pig enjoy it. But I'm <laughs> all right. Do we have uh, uh, do, Will? Do you have anything to offer for it? Would say that you also notice this with all kinds of behaviors of like what they're seeking. Like with my kids, I notice my son when he really wants attention will tackle his sister because then suddenly we have to pay attention to them. 
And if we spend more time doing things for them, they fight less. All right. All right. What is our next question? How would you talk to your significant other about learning more about your ADHD to help them understand what you're dealing with, to help prevent a lot of the disconnect that happens while talking? Mm, um, that's, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I, I think that there has to one be a willingness first to, to learn because you can't like, you know, no one likes to be shoved information. Um, and, you know, you can express how important it is to you that um, your, your partner understands and, and starts learning about uh, the ADHD, you know, thinking about and even asking, like, how would you best receive this information? Do you want, do you want uh, a book? Do you want an article, a podcast, a, a video? Like find out what, what, um, what is going to help them receive that information the best um, and maybe explore with them what are maybe the barriers if there are, if there is resistance to, you know, there's some people who kind of come into to this, like with the whole, you know, oh, I don't believe in ADHD, right? Which is like, which if you hear that, I just want to encourage you to first take a few deep breaths, right? And know that like it comes from places that like, don't look at that as like a black and white thing, like explore, get curious about where that comes from, right? Because there's so much science behind it so if, if it's an issue of well so and so you know so dr quack said this wasn't a uh you know there was a book that says adhd doesn't exist um right we can't we we counter misinformation with accurate information right um and you may want to explore uh counseling and specifically in an area and with someone who specializes in adhd and i think that's exceptional ex um, especially important to, to not see just a general like family therapist or couples counselor because it, uh, it can honestly do more harm than good when because you can really get into, you know, blaming and not understanding and shaming. Um, and, you know, it's it's ADHD is part of a relationship when you're in a relationship with someone with ADHD. Right. You might not like it, but like it's part of the relationship. And, you know, and maybe if you're someone who was diagnosed later in life, like. It's not that you, there was false advertising going into the relationship. You didn't know you had ADHD, right? So I think that that all of those kind of components are important parts of the conversation. Um, and uh, and it, just, it takes time. It is really just, it takes a lot of time. What are, what are your guys' thoughts? I kind of had to do all those things, Eric, that you were talking about. And one of them was really key was finding the modality that worked. Um, for a husband who has dyslexia, podcasts were the way to go. Um, and then I asked for it for my birthday present. I was like, could you, you know, this, because my birthday's in January this year, that would really mean a lot to me, even if you listen to one episode a month. And uh, so he was willing to commit to that. Going into this with my wife, I watched a lot of uh, Jessica McCabe's uh, How to ADHD videos with my wife. Um, I was just be started off with, hey, I've been learning about these things about my ADHD that I didn't know. I thought you might like to know too. And uh, it's always helpful for me to not like talk at a person because nobody likes to be lectured. So if you're sharing knowledge, don't try to like be like, here's what it is. Be like, here's the resource I learned it from. Usually works better for me. I'm Jake, go ahead. So the way that I found out that I was ADHD is that my partner is ADHD. Um, but just because we're both ADHD, um, you know, our, our uh, ADHD subtypes are also different. So even that still requires communication and understanding and learning about, um, you know, our own ADHD so that we can, you know, sort of have those open conversations and understanding when, you know, we're both trying to get things done at the same time or not. So that, that open communication and Definitely not shitting on each other is important too, um, because you know I'll, I'll echo what was said earlier. Like nobody likes to be told what to do. We don't want to be, you know, don't want to have information shoved down our throats. And I think for me, because it was kind of left open of, hey, you might have ADHD if you want to look into that. You can, and then I did, and then now I'm here. <laughs> So it was good to and have now that you have a podcast. 
Yep. Two things. One, the best thing my wife and I ever did was she went to a workshop on ADHD with me. And so we were in person. Dr. David Nowell is the guy's name. We just went to this workshop, learned about ADHD. It was validating for me. She got to see that like, oh, that's a real thing that exists. And it's not just Brendan being an idiot or whatever. Um, and then the other thing, I'm, I'm kind of stuck on this last piece where it says, uh, help them understand what you're dealing with to prevent a lot of the disconnect that happens while talking. Some of that might be a communication thing. So I'm going to pivot out of like understand ADHD for a second and do a quick communication thing. My wife and I were doing this before anything with ADHD entered into our world. Um, one of the, she would be like, we have to have this big, important talk about like money or something. And she would just drop it on me. And I would get overwhelmed immediately, right? Because I am not ready for this conversation. It's a thing that stresses me out, or at least it did back then. Oftentimes when we have a big, important conversation, there's this asymmetrical information thing that happens where the person who wants to have that conversation has already thought everything out. And the person who is not ready for that conversation doesn't know what's going to happen is can be overwhelmed by that, particularly if they're the one with ADHD and they're maybe the cause of some of the reasons why we're having this conversation, right? So what my wife started doing for me that was great, I didn't ask her to, she just started doing it was she would send me an email when she wanted to talk about something that she knew got me all tweaky and would just kind of like give me a general idea about what she wanted to discuss. And she would send it to me while I was at work. And I would then have like the rest of the day before I got home to think about what I wanted to add to that conversation, what my ideas were. And then I came to that conversation more prepared and they went a lot smoother. So I highly recommend using that kind of a strategy. If you've got a big idea that you need to talk to with a partner, send them a little bit of a hint with some bullet points or something so that they can process in advance. And then you come to the table and you both have thoughts. And I think too, like approaching it, you know, one of the things that we we do in our, our coaching groups is really um, sort of promoting experimentation, like try something and then pull back and say, Hey, how did this work? Right? Like, we try to have this. So the idea is to kind of come out of the content of the conversation and really explore how the communication is working. Right. If, if, you know, doing it while, you know, in the car, in traffic, bringing this topic up, like stresses your partner out and like almost cause you to get into an accident. Like maybe that is not the right time to do it, but maybe, you know, like what, what Brendan was saying, you know, uh, giving a heads up or maybe having a, a text conversation, um, I used to work, there was a, a clients I used to work with and I in my clinical practice who had a private blog and this is how they communicated over difficult topics. They blogged to each other, which was just like a really interesting, uh, a way to, way to do it. And it worked for them. Right. So, you know, it's, it's all about like, all right, what works? Is there a willingness to experiment? And I also think that, that I can't say enough about exploring the role of, uh, of attachment in adult relationships and how we show up for each other. Um, so there is a book called Attach that I really want to recommend to, to anyone who is in a relationship or wants to be in a relationship. It just, it helps make things make so much more sense. Um, and so, yeah, I just want to, it's one of those books that I just, I wish I would have understood and known about 10 years ago. Um, so there is that. So um, I know we have a bunch more questions but um, what I want to do is uh, take a quick break. And uh, when we come back, we will answer more of your questions. So we will be right back. I'd heard this podcast and then like I listened to my first episode and then during the break, Eric talked about this program. And so I was like, that sounds amazing. Like that sounds like exactly what I want to do. Our first registration event for our summer sessions is next Tuesday, May 18th. The deadline to RSVP for our kickoff event is this Sunday. I learned the value of working in groups that I've known. Groups and communities of people committed to living fuller lives and supporting each other. It's immeasurable. It's absolutely magic. And I discovered that this group and community was one of the most supportive spaces I could have asked for. I've never had better cheerleaders in my life. 
if you're thinking about joining, please do. <laughs> please do. Like a, like a lot of people said, I wish I had joined sooner or made this step sooner because I just feel like I grew a lot personally in ways I didn't expect. If you are thinking about joining this group, I'd highly encourage it. There was something amazingly special about growing with a group of people who all had similar struggles as I did. It was encouraging, it was safe, it was inspiring, and above all, it was healing. And this group is like a scaffolding for us to move from intention to action. And the scaffolding is above the, the muck and the stories and everything else. If you have a scaffolding on a building, you're renovating it. You could be renovating or renewing it. And that building is us. For me, the building project is trying to open the windows, increase the size of the windows. And when the size of the windows increase, more light gets in. And just as importantly, more of our light gets out. Before this group, it seemed like I just couldn't get anything done and I would do everything I could to avoid even the simplest tasks. But now uh, instead of punishing myself and feeling guilty for how my brain works, I can believe and achieve and take pride in my successes and get excited for my future. And I decided to join this group because I felt like I needed additional structure in my life. I had decided to join the group because even though I had made a lot of progress with individual therapy and medication and my own self-work, I just felt like my growth was plateauing. And I really just wanted to try something like drastically different from everything that I had tried before. What I learned from this group is like, this is actually what would be most helpful for you to do the thing that you actually want to do. I have seen so much value just in the past 10 weeks that really like the value is way more than the cost of the program. And what's really great is that the investment is just going to continue to pay off in the future, right? So all the skills that I have now, I'm just going to keep using them. And so I'm so excited to see like how much I've grown over the past 10 weeks, but I'm even more excited to see how I'm going to take all these skills I've learned into other parts of my life. I'd say if you're thinking about joining the group, that it is a program that just offers so many different benefits that you can find whatever it is you're looking for within the group. And if it doesn't exist, it can be created. And this has now made it easily the biggest group that I would say, hey, this is the one you've got to try, even if you've tried a million others. And my biggest takeaway was the importance of community and the reason why I chose to do this coaching group as opposed to therapy or individual coaching sessions was because I did feel that it would be important to have that sense of a community. And what I didn't expect was how useful the adult study hall sessions would be and how much I would be kind of welcomed into the alumni through the study halls and through the alumni planning sessions. And I've started to feel like I'm part of a broader community outside just our group. What I didn't expect was how valuable the sense of connection and belonging in the group would be. I really came into this thinking, I'm super stressed out at work. I have way too much stuff to do. And now I have learned that I have this disorder that's making it all worse. So I just need some skills. I need to like work on this. And the friendship and the sense of connection and feeling like I'm not alone was not something I was prepared for, but I can't believe how valuable it is. And so I think if you're thinking about joining this group and in particular, if you really feel like you need that sense of community and that sense of structure, then this would be a good fit for you. So if you're thinking about doing this group, go for it. This is the place if you have ADHD to be. Come join ADHD Rewired's 25th season of award-winning coaching and accountability groups. Registration is by invitation only. If you've already added your name to our summer interest list, then keep an eye out for your email for an invitation to join our registration kickoff event. But if you've not yet added your name to our summer interest list, then the first step is for you to go right now to coachingrewired.com and click the big red button. Get your name added, put reminders and times in your calendar, and keep an eye out for your email so you don't miss your invitation to join our upcoming registration events. If you're listening to this episode on the day it came out, that means the registration kickoff event to join our 25th season of coaching and accountability groups is next week on Tuesday, May 18th at 1.30 p.m. Central. That's next week on Tuesday, May 18th 
at 11.30 a.m. Pacific, 2.30 p.m. Eastern. But make sure to check your email for the instructions of what you need to send to us by this Sunday. The website again is coachingrewired.com. To get your invitation to register and to get the most up-to-date information about our coaching groups, go to coachingrewired.com. That's coachingrewired.com. Save the date. The virtual doors to the Adult Study Hall membership community will open on May 20th at 12 p.m. Central. Are you sure? I think so. That's next week, Thursday, May 20th at 12 p.m. Central. Sounds like noon central to me. That works. <laughs> at noon o'clock central. Hi, MJ. Hi, everybody. So we're recording this while we're actually both in Ash at a way too late o'clock. Hey, it's a place to be if you want to get stuff done. It's great because it's open all day, every day. And sometimes when you need another adult this time of night or day or wherever you are, it actually kind of works. It really helps with we're all kind of helping each other get back on track because no one's meds are longer in our system. And um, yeah. Yeah, it checks out. It checks out. So in Adult Study Hall, you have access to our Ash Plus sessions, which are themed peer-led guided co-working time blocks designed to help you supercharge your productivity and cross the finish line. For those of you who do to, I just added a bunch of words there, I think, who <laughs> across, <laughs> across the finish line for those to-dos, you want to finally get off your list. <laughs> but if you prefer Actually, <laughs> but if you prefer to work with your own music and set your own check-ins, Adele Study Hall membership will also include access to Adele Study Hall on demand, which is where we're hanging out right now. Uh, open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, even on the weekends. And, and y'all can join me on Sundays from 930 Mountain to 1130 Mountain for some Sunday planning. That way you can get a kickstart to your week. Nice. The Dell Study Hall is your place at your pace and your ADHD friendly co-working space. Ooh, MJ, I like that line. That was well, was well crafted. I wrote that. It's cheesy, but I love it. It's good. It's good. Once the virtual <laughs> doors open to your adult study hall community, the first 100 members to join will become one of our founders to get to lock in their membership rate at 50% off the membership cost. I just lost my train of thought. I'll just say, go back to the script. As long as you're, <laughs> as long as you're active, your membership cost will never go up. Membership to Adult Study Hall community is $19.99 is a month, which will include peer facilitated Ash Plus sessions and Ash on Demand. Did we explain what Ash stands for, Adult Study Hall? I think you did last week, but I'll reiterate. So Ash is Adult Study Hall. So if you hear things about Ash or Ash Plus, we're referring to Adult Study Hall and the Adult Study Hall community. The virtual doors open next week on Thursday, May 20th at 12 o'clock p.m. Central. So don't miss your chance to join this brand new community and lock in the founder's rate of just $9.99 a month. Go to adultstudyhall.com and add your name to the list. It's going to be a big week next week with Tuesday kicking off coaching group registration for the summer and Thursday kicking off the opening of our brand new membership community. It wasn't actually our intention to plan it that way, but that's just the way it happened. So we will see you next Thursday. See y'all, everybody. See ya. Thank you, MJ, for helping me record the ad in Adult Study Hall. <laughs> no problem, because sometimes we are not the adults we need. <laughs> Good night.
Good night. <laughs> and we're back. All right. Thank you, MJ. Angela, what is your question? So I'm giving a talk to a professional organization in my industry, which is the alcoholic beverage industry, about eliminating the stigma of neurodivergence in corporate culture. Awesome. And my, my plan is to connect the audience to the subject matter by illustrating executive function and how it relates to everyone, regardless of your if you have ADHD or any kind of neurodivergent condition or not. But what do you guys think is the most important key uh, learnings to address that inspires action? And for context, my goal is to provoke a thoughtful conversation and consideration when we build out our diversity, equity, inclusion initiatives. And the first thing, Angela, first of all, like, that's awesome that you're, you're doing that. It's such important work. Um, the first thing that comes to mind, I was thinking about like, what would be an impactful way to, to do this in a workshop is to generate an empathetic experience that really gives people that, oh, kind of moment, helping people see how actually people process information differently. Right. So whether you're maybe a, a visual person or more of an auditory person, um, whether you need you know, something in a certain way, I, I'm sure that there are different types of, of exercises that can sort of highlight um, the differences in how people sort of process information best. Um, so I think if you can do sort of a, a real world hands on experience um, or even, you know, sort of taxing their executive functions, then having them do something else. Um, you know, there, so there's a number of different different ways uh, to, to do that. Um, so. And I think, too, just like the, the idea that, you know, I always think that when people think that everyone should be able to do something, I, I think it's it highlights sort of a lack of empathy. Right. And I, so I think sort of drawing that distinction between like, look, like to, to say that everyone should be able to do things the same way. Right. Like it's either you're lacking empathy or like you're a sociopath. I mean, I don't know, like, and most people wouldn't want to be called a sociopath. Right. Um, but also looking at a lot of the, the strengths and the, the features that often people who have neurodivergent brains can, um, you know, really provide to an organization. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, with ADHD, often we are very big idea people. Um, and sometimes we can go really deep onto something that we are interested in. Um, you know, sometimes for people who are maybe on the autism spectrum, they, there's certain things that they can do, um, you know, that uh, as a function of just the way their brain processes information can be a real asset um, to, uh, to a company. Um, so I think really highlighting, uh, these different sort of profiles of learning types and of, of brain types can be really, uh, really helpful. Um, so that's just my off the cuff, you know, spitfiring ideas. Brendan, what do you got? I have a terrible idea. I have what is probably a demonstrably terrible idea, but I'm sharing it anyway. You know what industry she works in? Alcohol industry. You know what affects executive functions? <laughs> <laughs> so get everyone drunk and then have them do like hard cognitive tasks. The reason I think this is a terrible idea is the stigma side, right? Cause now you're like, Oh, it's so just someone with ADHD is like a drunk. <laughs> like that's not the message you want to send, <laughs> right. but there and might be something gonna, in there. It's going to be online. So it's a live chat kind of thing. Okay. So it won't be in person. So so so. Yeah. <laughs> Brendan, do you have yeah, more? No, I'm done. Okay. That's such a bad idea. I, I've done a number of things with educators. And so you will be able to Google things like where you're trying to read something where, you know, the text is backwards or there's like color and you you need to read the word and it's um, but it's a different color, things like that that can throw people off. I used to run a program that started it was for kids, but it would work with adults. The general concept of what an experience at light is like to be overloaded with your senses and your communication. And the basic premise was you chose something that represented each scent. So we had like a feather duster that we put peppermint oil on. Um, so you wouldn't necessarily be able to do this one online. So it's a little bit more difficult, but basically like we added lights, sounds, music, touch, all these things, had them use a sock hand, something with their different hand. Then we tried to give them a spelling test. And, and, and then we talked about what it was like when you can't 
you know, those things are hard to filter. But so because people were asking in the chat what I meant about a simulation game. So it's just something that simulates what it's like to have that experience. And there's things like that for sight. There's things like that. So there, you know, if you Google, there are probably things that aren't like my big money things that you might be able to cobble your own together because we have imagination and creativity. Except for, um, is, it, is it this week? It, no, it's going to no. be in June. So I'm, 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 it's I'm, tomorrow. I've been hired to. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Eric, just, just so you know, I'm your accidental a hole. I, I I recognize the name, and I was like, I think she was on the podcast. Um, but I like my brain was like, it wasn't a strong enough of a connection where I could have said like, yes. But so thank you for uh, and yeah, that was a that was a great podcast. Thank you. All right. I hope that was helpful for you. Um, it really and, was. And uh, in the chat, if anyone has other ideas, uh, please throw them in there. You might want to check out the work of Rick Lavoy too. Yeah, that, Fat City. Yeah, that might be a way to go. Fat City, when the chips are down, that stuff that might work out work out well for you. All right, let's go to our next question. All right, it's um, Ellie. All right, Ellie. Hi, um, I'm 44, and I've just been diagnosed with severe combined type ADHD, which is great, and um, the medications making a big difference. Um, but I'm feeling a little bit overwhelmed because it's almost like the blinkers are off and I can see how much of a, a shambles I'm in. Have you got any tips for how I can get organized or maybe just sort of sidestep that overwhelm um, to get back on track? Thank you. Can I ask a clarifying question here? Because uh, like, I, I, I'm hearing sort of two things in your question. Uh, one of them is, so it sounds like you started taking medication and now you're noticing kind of all the the stuff in your life that just seems to be disorganized and kind of all over the place. Is that is that correct? Yeah, I think I've maybe over the years just kind of learned to ignore it or I don't know, but it really felt like when I started the medication, I was suddenly much more aware that I was in a shambles. Um, right, right. And- so, you know, one of the, the uh, a very common phenomena when uh, people start taking medication is they feel like they're doing worse when they're actually doing better. And it's because like you're now noticing all the stuff because you're paying attention to all the stuff. And that that gap between what your intention is and what your actions are uh, becomes that much more noticeable because your your brain is probably thinking a lot more clearly. And now that you see all these things, it's hard for your brain to think clearly because it's overwhelming. Is it, was that accurate? Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what it's like. Yeah. Okay. So I think one is sort of acknowledging sort of that, just that emotional component, uh, you know, with, with a later in life diagnosis, you know, there is a, a, a element of grieving that, that needs to happen, right? An acknowledgement of, oh my gosh, like this has been happening my whole life. Like I didn't even realize how uh, significant that is. Um, and so allow yourself to grieve. Also, don't allow yourself to get stuck there, right? So looking at like, you know, we can only do so many things at a time. And I know it's really, you know, when we have ADHD, we want to do all the things and we want to do it yesterday, right? And that's one of the fastest, best ways to do none of the things ever, right? So less is always more, right? Identify, you know, bite-sized pieces of what you can do, right? If you can... Um, you know, part of it is about setting more realistic expectations about what's really possible uh, in in a day. Um, that can also be helpful. Will, it looks like you got something you want to jump in with. Yeah, because there's another aspect of this that I always find to be troubling is they'll be like, okay, I'll just do one thing at a time. So it's like, okay, I'm going to go, you know, start working out once a week. And then a weekend, I'm like, that was super easy. Now I'm going to work out seven days a week. And it's, uh, you know, just let yourself get acclimated to the changes before you start adding on to the changes. It's really hard to do because we want to do more and more. And what, if what we're doing is feels easy, that's great. It means we can keep doing it. Ellie, is that helpful? Yeah, totally. Thank you very much. You bet. And, and good luck. I mean, that's, I think 88, when you get diagnosed with ADHD, it is a good news diagnosis because there is so much that we can do 
uh, around management of it, or whether it's uh, behavioral strategies, environmental modification, uh, medication, coaching, therapy, um, professional organizers. I mean, there's so much that can help. Um, but again, one thing at a time. And, you know, one other thing is I would just say, try not to take it so seriously. You know, it's yes, it can be serious. But if we take ourselves too seriously, it can become this huge overwhelming like, oh, my God, I got to fix all the things, right? You know, and just, I just want to kind of um, maybe give you reassurance that nobody here that you're seeing, hearing on this, uh, you know, in, on this panel has all of their shit together, myself included, right? So I just want to, to cause I, you know, I do often hear, oh, you, you got all your shit together. I'm like, whoa, no, no, no. I don't know where you got that idea from, like, there are absolutely days and, and weeks where I am also on the struggle bus, right? You know, it's, it's, we grow one day, one week, one month at a time. And over time, those, the, the efforts we make towards growth uh, kind of stack on themselves. And, you know, one day you'll be, you'll look back at every so often and reflect back in your life. And you're like, oh my gosh, like, how did I get here? I didn't think that this was possible. Right. And so I just want to really encourage you to, um, Patience, hope, community. I think community is one of the most important things, uh, when, especially when, they're, when we're newly diagnosed, is to uh, have that support from your community because um, it can be lonely if you think it's just you. All right. Let's go to a, another question. Actually, Gail has a question. How do you help somebody who you might think has ADHD? And is there anything that you can do to kind of help them? realize that oh that's that can be sticky and it depends and you know when if you are not a doctor or a mental health provider um that would be my first thing of caution like you're not a doctor or a mental health provider um you know if is this person like coming to you sharing that they're struggling and they don't know what to do or is it that you're just seeing someone in your life who is just kind of a hot mess and you're like, I, this looks familiar to me. Um, so I think it really just de depends on the nature of the relationship. Um, but if you are going to suggest something, I would do it in like sprinkles and see how they respond to the first bit of sprinkles before just going, you have ADHD and you need to go get diagnosed because, you know, it's so clear you have it. Like, mm, that's probably not going to be the best approach. Um, what, what are all your thoughts? So I'll just say like if, because again, my, my partner is ADHD. And so that's how I discovered I had ADHD. If it was more like um, if they had been like, go get diagnosed already. Like it's obvious that you have it. What am I going to do? I'm going to say, I'm not going to do that. So it was, it really was a lot of just little gentle nudges of, oh, by the way, you keep your the cupboard doors open quite a bit. That's kind of an ADHD thing or hey, you forgot the sock on the floor. That's an eight, like could be an ADHD thing and nothing really framed as like, well, that's ADHD. It was, well, it might be. And so as I started adding it up and becoming a little bit more self-aware from little hints that were very, like they weren't mean or visceral. They were just, oh yeah, just, just like a reminder. Um, it, slowly nudged me into that direction to be open to to thinking about having ADHD. So yeah, just be gentle. It's very helpful. Yeah. yeah. We're going to take a, a quick break. And uh, when we get back, we will have more questions uh, for you. So let's take a quick break and we will be right back. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from our Patreon community. Have you considered becoming a Patreon member because you've discovered or rediscovered something about your ADHD each week? If you do, consider giving a monthly contribution to help support this show. I want to welcome our newest member, Jen R., who joins the Patreon community at the $10 a month level. Thank you, Jen. To everyone who continues to show support for this podcast through Patreon, thank you so much. 
Your contributions have not only helped to support the podcast, but help me grow my team and start new projects so we can reach even more people everywhere with ADHD. If you want an extra boost of support, patrons at a $25 a month level can join me for a group coaching call every fourth Tuesday of the month at 3 p.m. Central. Patreon members giving $10 a month can listen to our group coaching call recordings and get ad-free episodes. But if what you're looking for are the ad-free episodes, you can join our Patreon community at just $5 a month. And if you don't mind the ads and you're in and you're not interested in the perks, but you still want to say thanks, any dollar amount is welcome from $1 to $100 a month or more if you can. If this podcast has helped steer you in a positive direction in your ADHD journey and you're financially able to, consider becoming a member of our Patreon community. I appreciate everyone who continues to give every single month. I can't tell you how grateful I really am to be a part of your journeys and to watch this community grow. And if you're not in a position to give, no problem. I am glad you found this podcast and find it helpful. But if you are ready to join us on Patreon, go to ADHDrewire.com slash Patreon, where you can learn all about the perks and our growing Patreon community. That's ADHDrewire.com slash Patreon. Or just click the Patreon tab at the top of our homepage. And thanks. It's been over seven years since I started this podcast. Now, we're a network of hosts with ADHD across North America. Every week, I am joined by four other hosts on the ADHD Rewired Podcast and Network. There's Brendan Mahan, the host of ADHD Essentials, whose podcast focuses on parents, families, and educators with ADHD. Brendan's show is similar to this one with in-depth interviews about communication, transitions, and even Dungeons and Dragons. There's also Will Curb, who hosts Hacking Your ADHD, where he shares some of his favorite tools, tips, and tactics to work with our ADHD brain in short episodes that run about 15 minutes each. MJ Siemens is the host of ADHD Diversified. MJ talks about intersectionalities of being Asian with ADHD. So far, she's been sharing a lot of her own personal experiences. And coming soon, she will be having her first guest interview as she aims to diversify the voices of ADHD. Did I mention that MJ will also be joining us again in our coaching groups this summer? Moira Maven is the host of the ADHD Friendly Lifestyle, and Moira is not just a host, but she's also one of our coaches in our coaching and accountability groups. On Moira's show, she goes in depth about her experiences of being a mom and late diagnosed woman on the path towards a more ADHD friendly lifestyle. You can search for any of these podcasts on your favorite podcast app or by going to ADHDrewired.com and click on podcasts to check out all the shows on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. And you can join us every second Tuesday of the month for a live Q&A with the next one being today, if you happen to be catching this on the day it came out. And if it's early enough, on the day it came out, you can join me and Moira and MJ and Brendan and Will today at 10.30 a.m. Pacific, 1.30 p.m. Eastern. Head on over to ADHDrewire.com slash events to register. We'll be streaming live on Facebook, but if you want to interact with us, ask us a question or chat with others listening in, the best way to do that is to go to ADHDrewire.com slash events so you can join us on Zoom. Remember, you can find all of us at ADHDrewire.com. Then click podcast at the top of the page. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us those bucket filling ratings and reviews and make sure you are subscribed so new episodes get delivered to your podcast app of choice automatically. And if you have an online support group that meets tonight or maybe later this week, set a reminder to share this with them. They'll love you for it. And you know what? I will too. Thanks for listening. 
All right, we are back. And uh, if you're listening to us on the podcast, uh, one of the things you, you don't hear is the conversations we have uh, between uh, commercial breaks. Um, and Brent, we were talking about how awful all of us are here with email. Uh, sorry, Bar- Barb didn't mention that she was awful with email. Barb's actually, you know, she's pretty good with email. Um, <laughs> relatively speaking, I think. Um, <laughs> but Brendan has, a, has a, an email hack that he wants to share. I can't believe I haven't told this on the Q&A yet. Um, and if I have, I apologize. So I figured out that my problem with email or one of my big problems with email is how ethereal it is, right? Like email never gives me a sense of accomplishment. I never get any dopamine out of it because a lot of the time it's like I sent the thing out and maybe it'll turn into something. Maybe it won't. It's just an open loop hanging out there in the world. And I don't feel like I did anything. It's not concrete enough. So I went on Amazon and I bought a counter like they have outside of the clubs, like the click counter to see how many people have come in. And I just use that when I do my emails. I feel like I get credit for having sent an email, replied to an email, whatever. And it's I because I at the end of like an hour or two, I could be like, I replied to 27 emails today. I did something. Whereas before, two hours later, after replying to 27 emails, I don't feel like I did anything. And I don't know if 27 for two hours is the right number to time match up. I don't want people to be like, oh my God, that many in that time. I'm just throwing out stuff, but it's phenomenal and it's the way to go. Thank you for that hack. All right. Let's, uh, we got Lori who has a question for us. Yes, it was. How do you all make it to anything, even one thing on time? Okay. Practice. Practice and more practice and accountability and letting people know when you, it's don't just focus on what time you need to get somewhere, focus on what time you need to leave. Right. Cause that, cause if you don't leave on time, everything else is affected by that. Um, you know, one of the things that we do in our coaching groups is we, uh, we require people to be there five minutes before group starts and the, which, you know, I think when I was younger and I, if I were to hear, hear that, that I had to be in a meeting five minutes before it starts, I would think that that person just had it out to get me and, and hated me. And, um, like this is a big conspiracy against me personally. Um, but now what I understand is if we want our brain to be ready on time, our body actually needs to be there at least five minutes ahead of time. Cause like logging in, sitting down or showing up just at the moment that meeting starts, right? Like, you're not really ready. You're like getting yourself situated and settled and, uh, and having to do that. Um, you know, other strategies include using uh, either Waze or Google Maps, and it will give you uh, not just like the time you need to, to leave, but it, you can do it based on the time of day, right? So if different times of day, um, you're going to need to to make more time for travel. And I also know that Waze, if you give it access to your calendar and you have the address of where you're going in your calendar, it will send you a notification if there is traffic and you need to leave earlier, which is awesome. So that is um, another And Waze also will tell you if, if there's detours and it will help you avoid traffic and police. It will let you know if police spotted. Ahead. So that will also save you time having to go to court, which is for paying for a ticket and uh so you can be on time for that one too. All right. Other strategies for being on time. I just wanted to add on that when you're, how long it takes to get someplace, there's all these invisible transitions, like time it takes you to get your shoes on and go out to your car. It feels like it takes zero time, but it exists. And then especially on the other end, parking and then finding where you need to get into. Like if I get to a, my one thirty appointment at the parking lot, I am late. Yes. Yes. Um, do y'all know how long it takes you to leave your house? Thanks to you. Now I do. How long? It, there's a difference of 10 minutes. So from when I think I'm leaving to when I actually drive away. So I allow for 15 because I also have children and I never go to the bathroom. So I'll need to do that before I leave. All right. Will, what about you? Definitely depends with kids. Uh, just by myself, I can get out the door in like less than five minutes. But with my son, it takes seven. With my daughter, it takes 15. MJ, do you know how long it takes you to get out of the house? I don't have kids. And it takes me about half an hour <laughs> from when I am ready for the day to go back and forth and check every room that like, okay, I've got this and I've got this and I've got this. And oh, wait, I forgot my lunch. And oh, wait, where's my phone? Oh, wait, 
My phone's in my pocket. Where's my glasses? They're on my face. Oh, wait, it's Sunday. I don't have to work today. <laughs> I've done that. <laughs> Brendan, what about you? If the kids are involved, 15 minutes. If it's just me, a minute. Wow. Like I just have to walk out the door and grab my bag on the way by if that's what is needed. Uh, unless I'm going to Kempo and then I need five minutes to put on my gi and grab my gloves and all that kind of stuff. Okay. And my rock. Yeah. I, my, I average about seven minutes to get out the door from the time. I'm like, all right, time to go. To the, 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 I don't do too much of the going back and forth. But I got to tell you, if you do not own a tile, I cannot recommend this. En- like I use my tile probably two to three times a week. Right. And it probably saves me hours so i got one like a year or two ago and i really cannot believe i actually functioned as an adult without one more the other piece with the tile is when you can't find your phone you can use the keys to find the phone right um but i have to work backwards so if i have to be somewhere at a certain time i have to figure out the timing backwards and what i need to do to be ready so that will kind of be the like primary focus. And then once I've figured out that slot of time, if there's any other time left, then I can figure something else. But I just have to make sure that I don't then like not start getting ready. Yeah. And I think just just count on the fact that it's going to take more time than you think it will. It's going to take more time than you want it to take you. And just because you made it across town once in 10 minutes doesn't mean that you're ever going to do that again. Okay. All right. What is our next question? Actually, this is from uh, Chase or okay. Chaz. What are the overlaps and symptoms between ADHD and child traumatic stress? And then he also asked the question, what do you recommend for people who may have multiple diagnoses? Let me start uh, the last question first. We know that most people with ADHD have multiple diagnoses. ADHD is a disorder that like that has lots of friends like anxiety and depression and learning disabilities and dyslexia and, 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 right. It is, it is fairly rare to find just ADHD. Um, to your other question, um, overlaps in symptoms between ADHD and tra- childhood traumatic stress. Um, it, there is a lot of overlap. And I also think that, that, uh, trauma is one of like, it's something that as a community, we need to be talking a lot more about because it is so pervasive. You know, I used to think that um, like when it, when it came to my, uh, my coaching groups, I used to think that people who have experienced trauma might not be like the best fit for group. And it wasn't that at all. Cause I, as I'm learning more about trauma and I've got done uh, some pretty deep training now, uh, on, on trauma is like how just pervasive it is. And it's like going to war is not the only thing that, that, uh, or witnessing a murder, right? We're talking about trauma by a thousand paper cuts, right? It's the, that perpetual, like, oh, I failed again. Oh, I was told I was not good enough again. The rejection, the, the, oh, I made that mistake again over and over and over again. Right. And so like in that, that stuff that lives in the body, it, it, when we see, um, you know, what could be just ADHD mind wandering could also be like dissociation, right? Which is a, tr- a trauma feature, right? And they can look very similar. Um, and so I often, and there was a, I think Chad put out a paper on this uh, or posted something about this not that long ago, where looking at the question of, is it trauma or is it ADHD? And like what this research paper answered was, yes, it's usually, if it's an, it's not or, it's and. The wall of awful is a trauma yeah. model. I say every time I talk about it, I say that just about. And and everyone who has ADHD who sees it, it resonates. And it's not really about ADHD. It's about trauma caused by ADHD. So, I yeah, it's, we have to talk about it. It's critical. Yeah. So I hope that that, that helps. Let's, uh, let's try to um, uh, get a couple more questions here. All right. How about... Uh... Carolina, similar to Andrew's question, how do I help my friends understand why it's difficult for me to be on time, even when it's important? Yeah, I mean, I think similar to our our answers from before, though, is, you know, it's sharing bits of information. 
Um, you know, and I think one of the things that often happens is we want to like talk to that person when we're late to explain it. That's like not the time to do it. Like the time to do it is by planning a conversation. Like, hey, can I talk to you about something? Right. And it's like, I know it's frustrating when, you know, I tell you I'm going to be somewhere at a certain time and I'm late and I know it's a pattern. And like, here's what I need you to understand, though, that this is this is not something I'm doing on purpose. I'm not, I'm not this is not an excuse. I'm just telling you that as a person with ADHD, like this is super hard for me and I'm working on it. Um, and I say as frustrating as it probably is for you, it's even more frustrating for me because I want to be there on time. Like I am not doing this on purpose, right? So I think that, you know, conversations and, and sharing sort of things like that in smaller doses might be helpful. You can also, if you're, depending on the relationship you have with this person, right? Kind of how that works. Because some people can handle that kind of a direct conversation and some folks can't, right? Um, particularly if it's someone who tends to take things personally, which might be happening here. Like you're late because you don't like me. Like that happens a lot. and It's got nothing to do with you, right? If you're dealing with someone like that, talk to them about someone else and you can make it up if you need to. You can be like, I was talking to my mom and she was all upset with me for being late. And I was like, mom, it's not about you. I'm not late because I'm mad at you or being resentful for you. I was late because I struggle with getting places on time and I have ADHD and da 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 right? Like if I, if I say that to my friend, Charlie, who I know is fairly often aggravated with me for being late, but I have that conversation with him at a time when he's not aggravated with me for being late, he can get that message without having to have that message delivered directly if he's not someone that can handle that kind of a direct conversation. If, if I can be diplomatic and passive aggressive for a minute. And if you're part of a bigger family and you're having family functions, we will eventually have family functions again. Um, don't be the person that signs up to bring appetizers. Dessert. Bring the dessert. Absolutely. Like, don't give the person with ADHD. You know, cause even if it's at your own house, because you could be late to your own party. I don't know. It's hard. I, I would host parties and I would do the chips because I'm doing the venue and then I'm there. But then you're the only one not driving ever. So you got to watch that, too. Um, can't remember. And it's gone. All right. So let's go to the next question. All right. This is from uh, S. Okay. How does, yeah, how does screen time affect kids and teens with ADHD? Is this different from how it affects neurotypical kids and teens? Oh, this is a big topic. So I'm trying to organize my thoughts on, on this one because there's the, in the context of COVID, which I just think we all have to just be like, we're all going through this and we're all going to have to kind of go through a digital detox with our kids at the end of COVID. And it's going to suck because um, like, I mean, our before COVID, like we were really like um, really just disciplined with our with, with our son, like two hours tops screen time a day. That's it. Oh, my gosh. If he only got two hours of screen time in a day, that would be like because the power was out and he didn't charge his iPad the night before. Right. Um, all the way she did recently do a screen free Sunday and he was he actually went along with it. Like I couldn't believe it. Um so I, you know, here's the problem, you know, so with ADHD, we seek dopamine and we love things that deliver lots of dopamine. And I look at video games as digital dopamine or digital drugs because it does stuff to our brain that other things don't do to that capacity. So it's, it's, yeah, it's really, really hard when we are seeking stimulation and here are these screens that provide it and nothing else in life really provides that level of stimulation and also helps, you know, kids feel successful when in other areas of life, they might not feel successful. Um, it's, it's really tough. And I think it involves a lot, a lot of conversations. You know, it's, it's part digital life is part of our life now, right? Like whether we like it or not. And I think that we have to have conversations around uh, around healthy use. And I think that, you know, one of the things that I think is really important, and I'm saying this talking to myself as well, um, parents, we have to model this for our kids, right? And like occasionally my son will be like, you know, Dad, are you, are you, are you busy with work again? And I'm like, on my phone. And I'm like, I'll, you know, I'll throw my phone across, like throw it to the couch. But nope, um, I'm here. I'm present. Like, 
doing something totally like not even important. Right. And so it's like, yeah, and I'm an adult and I have a hard time with it. And that's, you know, so that's something that I share uh, as well. Like it's one of the reasons I don't like playing video games because I love playing video games and I'm awful at, at monitoring and like modulating. Like when I tell myself, I'll just play for five or 10 minutes. That's a big lie. I tell myself, like, I wish it wasn't, I wish I can say five or 10 minutes and have it be five or 10 minutes. Like I can't do it. Like my brain like doesn't disconnect. It, it's it, like it locks in and I get this like just awful case of like just five more minutes, just five more minutes, just five more minutes for three hours. Right. And I'm an adult. Right. So I think sharing those kinds of things with your kids, especially if you also experience that, um, can be really helpful and, and working together on developing strategies uh, together to, to address it and use tech to help with tech. Like we have screen time. Um, you know, it's like my son knows he cannot get on any of his technology before seven because everything is locked down uh, like digitally. And I also, we have a, a, our pantry has an actual key to it. And so we put the stuff in the pantry as well. Um, at seven o'clock PM, all the devices turn off, right? Like, so it's not an argument. It just, it happens. Right. So it's, it happens ahead of time. Moira? So I have two teenagers and um, it's gotten increasingly difficult. And especially because for both of them, um, that's their social outlet and learning. There's a, there's a good comedian who was talking about Fortnite and talking about how he used to get in arguments with his child about coming for dinner and saying, you know, you got to leave right now, but it's like pulling your kid off the floor in a basketball game right in the middle of the game. Right. It's not kind of how like just turning it off. So he would, say to his child, okay, you have to kill yourself now because that's really the only time, like that's where they got to in their joke was because um, you either have to walk away or, so we've really had to learn to talk to our kids and find out about timing, make sure we're talking to them about how long they have and what the expectations are. And then we've had to have some really hard lines that we've had to follow through on. So over dinner hour, there's like, we've got everything turned off. Otherwise they won't come upstairs. Um, and same thing at nighttime. And then they have daily chores. If they don't do those by five o'clock, it all gets turned off for 24 hours so that they don't get it. And then the other thing we're starting to do is because um, my son, when they're allowed to play outdoors right now, uh, kids will come and knock on the door always when he has chores to do. And then we're like, but we want him to go play with the friends. So we're going to have like the, the bigger chores he has until Thursday of for the next weekend's playing so that, right. So he's doing them retroactively. So if he hasn't done it by Thursday and the friends show up on the weekend, sorry, you can't go. But if he did them retro like before and there's new ones coming, that's fine because he's got like five or six days, but we really have to communicate with them and figure out because especially for my son, it is his social world. And his friends are on there and that's how he communicates with them. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, like with my son, if, if he's already had like enough screen time, I think for the, the day and it's, you know, two o'clock in the afternoon and his cousins call him because they want to play um, Roblox together. Like I'm going to let them do it because it's social and he's really is social on there because they'll get on uh, audio FaceTime. And so they're talking to each other and I'm like, you know, and. I send on the spectrum. So I'm like, yes, social interaction. Absolutely. If it's on a screen, okay. Then a screen. We're also in a pandemic. So yes, social interaction. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that, that I'll, uh, and Brendan, I think this idea you gave me, it was about like focusing, cr- creating time versus consuming time. Yep. Yep. Which, that's me. Which I love. Like, cause it's, you know, there's w- the one thing, if you're creating, doing something creative on your device versus just watching these just all painfully awful YouTube videos of these gamers who, and I know they're so popular and they're so painful. They are so painful. I don't know like who, what your kids watch, but oh my gosh, it's. Ugh. I'm with you. I'm with you. An- another thing with, with screens is you've got to give them a compelling alternative. Yeah. Like you have to give them a compelling alternative. If, if they're on screens all the time and you're like, well, I, get off the screen and then there's not something else for them to do. They're going to go back to the screen because that's better. You've got to do th- like I today, my kids and I were hiking in the woods and then got ice cream. They were not on screens that whole time. I was cause I had to find out if the ice cream shop was open. But other than that, like we were just in the woods and I took pictures, but 
but things like Dungeons and Dragons and and Settlers of Catan and board games and and art projects and adventures and stuff like that. That's how you get your kids off a screen is you have other alternatives to it. Um, and I have a whole article coming out in Attitude Magazine. This you, don't, you don't say. You don't say. <laughs> you no, know, Brendan, I would love to talk to you because Brendan had gave that idea and my family took and run with it um, for getting doing things. And we have a whole bunch of games. We haven't been able to eat at our dining room table for days because the games are on them. But having one child who has a lot of LDs and and ch- and has challenges with learning games, like we can't get him to play Settlers of Catan. But it's too complicated. I've, actually, I've learned now how, right? And there's tweaks. And one of the things is we watch YouTube videos on how to learn how to play games. Mm-hmm. But um, that's a conversation I would love to have because I'm sure with you, because I'm sure there are other parents who want to play games with their kids, but they can't get them to play games, but don't understand what the stumbling box could yeah. be. One of the things we did was we have a whole section of our gaming pile stack stuff that's dyslexia friendly because we've got kids that hang out with our families who have dyslexia. And so the books, the, the games that are not reading heavy are better for those kids. So we just have a whole section that's like, this is the dyslexia friendly section. I, I so empathize with the, the like, learning complex games i so struggle with it and i was laughing because it like it i had to do that moira for uh for exploding kittens which really isn't that hard of a game it took it's me not. it took me 45 <laughs> minutes to like really understand the game right? this is what you need to do you need to find a crew of people who play board games that totally. already exist if you can absolutely if there's a crew already built somebody in that group knows how to play all the games and knows how to teach all the games we have one of those it's not me <laughs> And if you're, my fighting, buddy Adam. if you're fighting at the table about what a rule means, then you can just Google it because there's all these like boards that people are like, yep. okay, this is how we've interpreted the rule. So um, it saves people stomping yep. off. Not and there that really that are happens. YouTube YouTube guides on how to play games. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the only way I can ever play any kind of board game other than checkers and mm-hmm. battleship. I want to, I just want to, I want to end with this. Um, so uh, there's someone who I, uh, know who's in in my life who was sharing with me that uh her uh they, they were playing battleship and clearly uh, her son had moved the piece on the battleship board and his uh her son responded mom they're boats of course they move <laughs> so i think we should end there um i know we have more questions but we do this every second tuesday of the month so we really really appreciate everyone who uh who has come and asked a question um Thank you so much, and we will uh, we will catch all of you next month. This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening, and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find summaries and additional resources for each episode. You can apply to our free and secret Facebook community. You can learn more about ADHD Rewired's intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups and sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content you won't get anywhere else. It's all at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click the Patreon button. If you're a regular listener and you're still listening to my voice, Consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron through our Patreon page. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to listeners, but it is not free to produce. And patrons get really cool perks. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tibbers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tibbers. You can also subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube. And you can subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube and see select interviews and some other videos I've posted. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends and your family and your clients, as well as your coaches, therapists, and doctors. And if you're a coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader, and you would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, 
You can request those at my website, ADHDrewired.com. And if you're a member of Chad or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this podcast. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. You know, you might be the person that turns somebody on to a podcast for the very first time. And if you really love this episode, please consider hitting share on your podcast player. I'm only one person and I count on you to help me spread the message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and to help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts, uh, Stitcher, or any other podcast app that accepts ratings and reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe on this podcast on your podcast app so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Not sure where to start? In no particular order. Check out Atomic Habits by James Clear, The Body Keeps Score by Bessel van der Kolk, 10% Happier, and Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics. These are both by Dan Harris. Change Your Questions and Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. The One Thing by Gary Keller and Jay Papasan. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Vaden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. Do you have trouble asking for help? Listen to The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. It's one of the best produced audiobooks I've ever heard. If you're looking for something a little bit more, say, magical, I unexpectedly fell in love with the Harry Potter series. And I don't usually listen to those kinds of books. And I loved it. And of course, if you haven't yet boarded the Brene Brown bus yet, check out Brene Brown's books, starting with The Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, The Power of Vulnerability, and if you're an entrepreneur or a leader in any capacity, check out her 2018 book, Dare to Lead. And Brene still is my most wanted guest. So if you know Brene, and you would be so kind to make that connection for me, I would be really, really grateful. You know who else I would like to have on the show? You. Click the podcast tab at ADHDrewired.com and then click the Be a Guest button at the top of that page and schedule a 15-minute pre-interview. This is Eric Tibbers reminding you to keep learning, keep growing, and keep connecting. Self-care is not selfish, and no matter what gets done or doesn't get done, at the end of the day, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.